Today, <clears throat> we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, and we're talking about the source of wisdom. And, and Paul continues um, that discussion that he started in the first chapter about the foolishness of the world versus uh, God's wisdom, or as the world sees it, the wisdom of the world and God's foolishness. And um, it kind of made me laugh, because usually, by the time I get to Sunday, I got a funny little story to start off with, and and some of that I got a nice outline, and you'll notice on your note sheet, I got nothing. You got the title, you got some application, nothing in the middle, and I was stressing over it, and then as I really started thinking about it, I thought it was ironic and a little bit funny, because Paul talks about when I come to you, I just come straight, I don't bring any funny stuff, I don't bring any eloquence, no entertainment, you just get the straight up stuff, and I thought, well, of all weeks to not not be inspired with anything funny, this is probably a good week. So my very sermon is a sermon illustration for you. Wasn't my idea. Let's read, if we would, uh, 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11 this morning. Remember the last thing that Paul said in chapter 1 was, if you're going to boast, boast in Jesus. And so he starts and he says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no human knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Remember, Paul had just finished telling the Corinthians that God's wisdom is foolishness to the world and that God's wisdom turns human wisdom upside down. That idea of proclaiming a crucified Messiah was beyond what the world could consider. They thought it was foolish. They thought it was silly. It was not the sign they were looking for. God's God's upside-down wisdom is further illustrated in his choice of the foolish and the insignificant things of the world. And that, Paul says, is how he came to Corinth. He came to them with a the simple message about what God had done through Jesus Christ. He didn't preach with the embellishments of human wisdom and eloquence. Uh, he just came as a witness to Christ crucified. And I never thought about that before. I haven't seen any scholars talking about it. First time we see Paul, still named Saul, is when Stephen gets stoned. And it says he was a young man. That was not very long after the crucifixion. And so, depending on what young man means there, I guess I never thought about the fact that Paul could have been standing there and seen the crucifixion. He was certainly in Jerusalem at the time. So he may very well have been a literal witness to cruise Christ, cruise let me back up and try it again in English. He very well could have been a literal witness to Christ crucified. His manner of preaching and his way of life was consistent with the message that he preached. Paul showed up to Corinth. He didn't give in to a desire to win approval of his audience, nor did he give in to the, to the schemes of human intelligence. He was certainly a man who could reason and debate. All you got to do is read Romans, and you see Paul's eloquence, his rhetorical mind. He was trained as a, as a Pharisee. 
He had legal training. He he graduated from the Harvard of the day. Paul was a smart guy. This is not a guy that got up there and was like, well, I don't know much, but uh, let me tell you about Jesus. Paul was an educated, intelligent guy. But he's saying, I didn't use all the tricks of the trade. I just came and I just told it to you straight. He says he was resolved. It was a conscious decision on his part to put an emphasis on Jesus and him crucified. He came as an ambassador, not as a salesman. An ambassador represents somebody. A salesman represents themselves, trying to earn sales with their own efforts to their own credit. I think pastors, if we're not careful, we can operate with that salesman's mindset, thinking that we get brownie points and extra credit for the more people we get to come to our church. And then churches can follow suit if they operate with the mindset that spiritual success is only measured in attendance. I've sat through so many meetings where the leaders of the church talked about, well, we don't have enough people coming. We need to get more people in here. One church in particular... Uh, We were sitting in a leadership meeting, and they said, uh, we need to baptize more people. That'll solve our budget issue. So I asked the question. I said, do we care if they get saved before we baptize them, or are we just dunking people at the front? And I got no answer, and I knew I was in trouble then. You know me. I can be a little bit snarky. I have the spiritual gift of sarcasm. So I suggested, since the Catholic Church across the street didn't do bingo on Friday night, that maybe we could do bingo instead, and that way we could get their money, but we didn't have to clutter the church with new people. I was really hoping they'd be mad at me. And they just sat there and stared at me, and I thought, I hope they're not really seriously thinking about this. We get off track when we begin to think of church and its success only as attendance, and people can excuse that and say, well, you're a small church. Of course you'd say that. I don't care. I've been part of bigger churches. If that is our mindset, we are thinking wrong. It's not about the crowd that we have here on Sundays. It's about the crowd that we take with us to heaven when we go. And when we operate with that kind of mindset, that leads us to marketing instead of ministering. And there's a big difference in trying to attract people versus ministering to people. It leads us to trying to figure out what the audience wants to hear. And so we don't talk about the hard stuff, like the cost of discipleship, dying to yourself, admitting that you're a sinner, surrender. We try to warm people up to the gospel and its demands. Well, why don't you just try a little bit of Jesus? You know? You'll like him. He's really nice. You don't have to change a thing in your life until you want to. You know, you could start out like, you know, I don't know, maybe give 1% and see how that goes. And if that doesn't pinch you too much, then maybe we could move up to 2%, you know, and, and you just kind of get used to it. And you don't really have to give up anything. You just, if you come on Sundays and have a good time, that's good. After a while, you might want to come to something else. We have a lot of fun events, and so you could do that for a while. In reality, that's manipulation. We're using the bait and switch technique. But somehow we never get to the switch. And we just have people who come to church for a good time who don't know what the Lordship of Christ is all about in their lives. And so they can look for something else when they get bored. Or when they decide it doesn't work, or they can decide, well, it's not very entertaining at this church. I need to go to a church with a better band. I need to go to a church, you know, they have a good light show over at this other church. The preacher over there is actually funny. <laughs> you know why we do the music that we do? Because I'm the only musician in the church except for my wife who plays the ukulele and the drums. I don't think we're ready for a drum set up here. There's not enough room. So you're stuck with me and what I can play. Y'all are awesome. You don't seem to care. (laughs) 
you have very low standards in the quality of music. <laughs> but that's the issue in some churches. The focus is off since it's about entertainment. Do they have a band or do they do hymns? Do they do this? Do they do that? We don't care. God, that is not how God looks at a worship service. That is not how God views worship. He doesn't go like, oh, I can't stand to listen to those choir songs anymore. Like, Gabriel has never leaned over to Jesus and gone, that band sounds really snappy this morning. <laughs> never happened. You can drag new music just like you can drag a hymn, and you can sing both of them like you mean it. And so thank you for letting us just do whatever. Paul didn't cater to what his audience wanted. He preached what he had been sent to preach. And when he says that he determined not to know anything, he doesn't mean that he left all other knowledge aside. He didn't just become like a turnip standing up there. But that the gospel with its crucified Messiah, that was his focus and that was his passion while he was with them. So if chapter 1 is true about the wisdom of God and the foolishness of men, then it only follows that our human wisdom won't win people to Christ. And in verse 3, Paul reminds them of how he came to them. I came to you in weakness. And he includes himself in those weak things chosen by God to shame the strong, back in chapter 1, verse 28. But he, what he doesn't tell us is what circumstances he mean. We don't know if he was ill. We don't know if he was weak because of persecution. It caused him fear and trembling. We don't know if that's a reference back to Philippians uh, chapter 2, where it says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. We're not really sure what he's talking about there. But whatever it was, it kept God, or kept God, it kept Paul from the poison of self-reliance and it let God's strength flow through him. And again, Paul emphasizes that he is not manipulating people with the wisdom of men, but he's allowing the Holy Spirit's power to be demonstrated. Preaching strategies that are centered around emotion or entertainment and personality, they might yield responses, but they may not yield results for God's kingdom. I think this principle is true. What you draw people in with is what you draw them to. So if we're going to draw them in with entertainment, then that's what they've been drawn to. And if the entertainment's not so good, then they go somewhere else for other entertainment. And Paul says it's the gospel that people need to be drawn to. It's just the gospel. I think of, we all have stories, I guess, of this, but I grew up in a church, we have revivals, which were some great things. And so I don't want to just throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I remember, I swear one night we sang 147 verses of Just As I Am. I'd been a Christian since I was nine, and I was ready to go forward again just to stop the service. I always wonder when you see those preachers on TV, they go, I see those hands, if there were any hands actually back there, you know, or if that was just their way to get other people to raise their hands or whatever. But sometimes we would milk those situations, and it's an emotional situation, and so we have people come forward, they cry, and they have this emotional experience, but it's not surrender. And in this day of vaccinations, maybe that was like a spiritual vaccination to them. Well, I went forward and cried that one time. I must be saved. But you see no evidence in their life. Which means basically they went forward and they cried. Which nowhere in the Bible does it say that that saves you. It's surrender. In contrast, or in spite of Paul's weakness, God's spirit accomplished God's purposes. Paul's preaching was effective because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit bears witness to the truth of the gospel message. And so verse 5 ties back to that boast only in Christ passage. And, and it gives us a picture of what Paul really means when he's talking about faith. To boast in the Lord is to depend on, to trust, to declare one's allegiance to, and to rely on the Lord. And to trust in the wisdom of man is a dead-end street, which 
is a guaranteed failure. And so Paul goes on, verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. But not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So in verse 6, Paul continues to contrast God's wisdom and human wisdom, but he changes the focus. Before, speaking from the world's perspective, God or Paul had talked about God's foolishness. Foolishness in air quotes. I don't know if they did that in, in Greek. But we do it, so. Now he approaches things from the perspective that God's wisdom is true wisdom. And so to those who are mature, there is a treasure trove of wisdom available. Who are the mature? Well, some think that line is drawn between believers and non-believers. Others think that Paul is contrasting the believers in the Corinthian church. There may have also been some sarcasm in Paul's statement aimed at the self-styled leaders who who claim maturity and superiority. And so if there's a tinge of sarcasm in Paul's choice of term here, then what he's doing is he's reshaping the Corinthians' perceptions of what it means to be mature or wise in relation to true Christianity or wisdom. So they think they're wise, they think they're mature, and he says, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature. So you have to decide, are you really one of the mature or you just think you're mature? But their behavior, the Corinthians' behavior, was not consistent with who they were in Christ. So they thought they were mature, but as we've already begun to see, there were issues in the church and their behavior was not reflecting that of wise people. Immaturity was being lived out in the way that they treated each other. Maturity is related to behavior, living out the paradigm of the cross in love rather than in just knowledge. The mature recognize God's wisdom, Paul says, but the rulers of the age did not. Well, who are these rulers? Are they the unseen demonic forces of this world, or are they they simply earthly rulers who put Jesus to death? Is there a dual reference, both to the earthly rulers and the demonic powers that inspired them? Whatever the identity of the rulers, the outcome remains the same. They will come to nothing. Their day is over, and the day of Christ is here. Why did the rulers of this age fail to recognize God's wisdom? Paul says, because it came in a mystery. Now, the way the word mystery is used in the Greek is different than the way we use it. We use it in the sense of, well, we didn't know something, and then we discover it. Now we know it. Mystery solved. In the New Testament, it's used to say that our ability to understand God's wisdom, God's plan, comes because God reveals it to us. So it's nothing that we discovered, but the mystery is something that God has revealed to us. God's wisdom is not a matter of human intelligence or discovery, but rather of divine disclosure. And maybe the mystery for us, even as those saved by Christ, is how God could love us so much that he would sacrifice himself and offer us forgiveness and eternal life. Paul talks about the mystery in Colossians. He talks about it in Ephesians and gives some other aspects of it. Like part of the mystery is the Jews thought that they were the only ones that were going to be saved and God's included the Gentiles. And there's all these things. We didn't know about it, but God knew. And so those are classified as mystery. But God has revealed it. Now we're aware of it. We didn't learn about it on our own. We learned about it because God revealed it. But how amazing is it 
How mysterious is it that God loves us so much? I love it. Verse 7, Paul says this. He says, the mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. That means that even before creation, God knew that humans would mess up and he already knew what he was going to do about it. Wow. The triune God, I don't know if they have conversations between themselves, don't know how that works, but the Holy Spirit God, Jesus sat at a table and said, they're going to mess up. We're going to make them, we're going to love them, they're going to mess up, what are we going to do about it? Someone's got to pay for that sin, Jesus said, I'll pay for it. Well, that means you're going to have to die. Okay, I'll do it. I'm sure that's not the way it happened. So while Satan and his demons knew who Christ was, James tells us that in James chapter 2, he says they even know that Jesus is the Son of God and they tremble, that does not mean, remember, Satan is not omniscient. He's not a god. He's not like the bad god. He's an angel that rebelled. So he's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He doesn't know everything. He's not everywhere. He's thinking, I get rid of Jesus. I solve the problem. Eh, wrong answer. They had no clue what the eternal implications were of crucifying Christ. If they had, Paul says, they wouldn't have done it. And the earthly leaders were clueless. They just thought they were solving a Jewish problem. What they thought was victory was ultimate defeat. Why didn't they know? Because God's wisdom is only known and revealed by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul paraphrases Isaiah 64, 4 to remind us that God's wisdom and plan is beyond our ability to find it on our own. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. And these are the things that God has revealed to us by His Holy Spirit. Some people take that phrase, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him, to mean that those are the things that are waiting for us when we get to heaven. And while it's true that we really can't comprehend the greatness of heaven, that's not what Paul's saying here. Look at verse 10. He says, these are the things that God has revealed to us by His Holy Spirit. The glorious thing has been revealed by the gospel. Not only can these things refer to the future, but they refer to the present. They express the incredible life, liberty, and light which the gospel communicates to those who have surrendered their life in faith to Jesus Christ. Before the life and the ministry of Jesus, God's people had a vague understanding of the glory of God's work and, and what it would do for his people, but they did not and really could not fully understand it ahead of time. You know, much of humans' intelligence is seen as a scientific breakthrough. You know, that's, we, we find the new discovery, we think we're brilliant. How do we arrive at our knowledge? Through three great sources of sentence, right? Seeing, hearing, thinking. What our eyes can see, what our ears can hear, and what our mind can think. But the Bible tells us that the brilliant scientist with the Ph.D. is no better equipped to understand the gospel than anybody else. By the way, we tend sometimes to see science as the opposite of faith. In fact, that's one of the strange things that I think we got going on now is it seems like people of faith are like, oh, science is terrible, blah, 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 you know, they blah, blah. That is a strange thing in history because if you go back to early scientists, if you go back to Newton, if you go back to Galileo, they were Christians and they were searching for some of the mysteries of God. How does God make this? How does God hold these things together? And so for them, faith and science, they went together. I don't think science is the opposite of faith. There are too many 
men and women of faith who are excellent scientists, who are superb at research, I think science shows us the amazing creative hand of God. Whether that's in the macro of an ever-expanding universe, or whether it's in the micro as we see the systems that God created for us to live. My dad was a research scientist in nutrition. And he used to say that the smaller he could see, the greater God was. That the smaller he could see, he felt like he could see God's handiwork. But you cannot find God in the laboratory. That frustrates some folks, doesn't it? If we could only put him in a test tube and prove his existence, and yet God still leaves it his faith. I can't show you a picture of the wind, but we live in Iowa. We can show you what the wind does, right? We can feel the wind. Sometimes it's a pleasant, gentle breeze. Sometimes it'll freeze your spinal cord right out of your body. But we know that wind exists. I think it's the same way with God. Only the Holy Spirit can tell us about God and His wisdom, is what Paul says in verse 11. That knowledge is unattainable by human wisdom or investigation. That word revealed literally means pulling back the curtain. So God pulls back the curtain to show us Himself. I didn't do the last paragraph because it would take another half hour to do that paragraph. It's so deep. So come Wednesday night, we'll talk about what it means to have the mind of Christ and how as Christians, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us and God gives us the Holy Spirit to begin to see the world like He sees it and to understand true wisdom. But what does this mean for us? How can we apply these truths to our lives? First, I think it's important that we know that you will not find God by human wisdom. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Seeking with all your heart, I think, indicates a willingness to admit that you have not been able to find God on your own efforts. Life is not working out. You have been your own God. You've been in charge. It's not working out, and you need there to be a God, and you want to find Him. So you seek Him with your whole heart. You've recognized that your life's not working. Your philosophy, your values, your pursuits have left you lacking. Maybe there's somebody here today. Maybe there's somebody listening at home, and you sense this force outside of yourself pulling you tugging at you, testifying to the truth of the gospel. You may not even want it to be true, but you sense that it is. That is a call from the Holy Spirit, calling you to Christ. So the second thing that we can take away is surrender. Give in to that tug. Admit to God that you're a sinner. Ask His forgiveness. Thank Him for His plan to save you. Thank Him for Christ paying the penalty for your sin by dying on the cross and rising again and surrender your life to His leadership. Surrender means that you give up. It's not an agreement because if you just agreed with God, that would mean that you're still trying to negotiate with God because you see yourself as an equal. Surrender means you give up. The war is over. God owns your heart. And the promise of God is that God, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in your heart and begins to transform you. He frees you from the bondage of sin. He gives you a new life. The Bible says it's becoming, it's like becoming a whole new creature because the Holy Spirit comes in, begins to open your eyes. You see God's wisdom. You desire to live with God's wisdom in your life and your mind begin to change. And then, believer, I think the implication for us is that we need to recognize the Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. And then we need to make the adjustments that He calls for. He may draw your attention to a certain Bible verse that He wants to work into your life. 
He may lead you to a promise in the Bible that He wants to use to strengthen you and encourage you. He may place a burden on your heart for someone, somebody that He wants you to minister to. He might convict you of a sin that you need to confess and get right, or of a perpetual sin that He wants to free you from. Maybe He brings to mind a relationship that you need to mend. God is the source of all wisdom. And as he speaks to you this morning, will you follow in obedience? Let's pray.